Good morning, Brooks. Good morning. Welcome to the 2024 Cum Laude Society induction ceremony in the Frank D. Ashburn Chapel. If you could begin by removing uh, earbuds, hoods, putting phones away, all those sorts of things, that would be great. Here in this space on this campus, I'll remind us that at Brooks School, we live and learn on land once of the Penacook people and we acknowledge their enduring presence. In 1906, Dr. Abram Harris, director of the Tome School in Port Deposit, Maryland, established the Cum Laude Society to honor scholastic achievement in secondary schools. The society is modeled on the Phi Beta Kappa organization at the collegiate level, and to become eligible for membership, a student's academic record must be of the highest quality, and the way they conduct themselves in our community must reflect well upon the school. This ceremony is a demonstration of our enthusiastic commitment to honor scholastic achievement at Brooks School. And to our guests, whether you are in this room or viewing this ceremony from across the world, we thank you for joining us. We'll begin with a performance of The Old Boatman, originally a piano piece by American composer Florence Price. If you'll permit me a brief moment of music history, The Old Boatman is among a large number of Florence Price's unpublished compositions that were discovered in 2009 in her abandoned former summer home. Price, who was the first African-American woman to compose a piece performed by a major American orchestra, died in 1953, and her work lives on through transcriptions and arrangements like this one. Now, under the direction of Dr. D'Angelo, the Brooks Chamber Orchestra.
Thank you so much, orchestra. Susanna Whitaker Waters, a native of Greater Boston and alumna of Park School and Concord Academy, completed her undergraduate degree in history with a minor in Caribbean and Latin American Studies at St. Lawrence University. She went on to complete a master's degree in education at St. Lawrence while teaching in a public middle school nearby. Mrs. Waters then spent a year at Holderness School in New Hampshire before deciding to move back to this area for good. Just like many of us in this room, she had to decide between Brooks and Govs, and for a wide variety of reasons, she credits the decision to come to Brooks as the smartest one she ever made. She feels that Brooks has given her mentorship, friendship, and most importantly of all, family. She arrived here as Ms. Whitaker Raleigh and met Mr. Waters at opening faculty meetings. Love at first sight. The family they built together, now including the famous Ainsley, Cal, and Millie, have supported Mrs. Waters' journey from history teacher to chair of the history department and into academic leadership. She has coached girls across and second basketball, dorm parented in Merriman, PBA, and Chase, and advised scores of students. The list of winter term topics she's taught demonstrates her breadth of curiosity, a cultural history of Ireland, the Battle of Gettysburg, U.S. immigration, local indigenous peoples, and the art, science, and business of death. Brooks benefits from her passion for continuous improvement. Mrs. Waters initiated the All Community Read and the creation of the Community Covenant and Community Pledge, and worked to help establish the Davis Fellowship and expand the computer science, sustainability, and students on the forefront programming. After completing a second master's degree at, in educational leadership at Columbia University, it was no time at all before folks at other schools started to think that Mrs. Waters might be ready for a new set of challenges. After this year, her 15th at Brooks, she'll begin her tenure as the ninth head of Fay School in Southboro, Massachusetts, and the first woman appointed head of school since its founding in 1866. I am grateful to Mrs. Waters for very many things, and right now I'm grateful that she's agreed to share some thoughts with you. To give the 2024 Cum Laude Address, please join me in welcoming Susanna Whitaker Waters. Thank you, Mr. Huntington, and good morning, Brooks School. All right. This past week, Cum Laude Society inductee and JV hoop star Sylvia Marks dropped some serious wisdom on us. She shared that, quote, growth is not always linear and that performance does not equal performer. Amen, sister. My growth was certainly not a linear path. My high school did not have a cum laude society, but if it did, I would not have been inducted. It has been one of the more enjoyable ironies of my career that I have been graced with the opportunity to serve as chapter president, as technically I should not even be a voting member. I was a hot mess in high school, and I loved every minute of it. This is my senior yearbook page. The quotation I chose nicely captures where I was in the spring of 2002. You will make all kinds of mistakes, but as long as you are generous and true and also fierce, you cannot hurt the world or even seriously distress her. She was made to be won and wooed by youth. What's that you said, Winston Churchill? Make all kinds of mistakes? Okay, I did. You know, I've spent a lot of time over the years trying to explain my life story to people when prompted, having felt a need to justify what may have been perceived by some as a sharp left turn, or perhaps a downturn, when I began as a new 10th grade student at CA. Sure, I was a disaster in Algebra II, chemistry, and believe it or not, US history, but I believe that I absolutely maximized my high school experience, and that was entirely due to the relationships I forged. A lot of the time I could have spent studying, I spent getting to know the people around me. These friendships have been the greatest gift, and you could even say they made for the most meaningful educational experience of my life. They have led me to where I am today. First of all, I want you to know that it truly shocks me, year in and year out, that any of you can get any work done outside the hours of 8 to 3.15. Truly flabbergasting. I know firsthand as the product of a boarding school that these institutions are designed primarily for fun of your own making. 
It gives me great joy to celebrate you today, cum laude scholars, because it is a real triumph to have accomplished all your advanced coursework when fun has been staring you straight in the face. Well done. I reflect on my high school study hours kind of like the vibe that the do not destroy guys have in the SNL writer's room. Deadlines looming, feeling punchy, focused on the next source of food, and the jokes freely flowing. Productivity, modest at best. I actually started out as a commuting day student, and everyone decided that it was in my best interest to save those two hours a day for studying, so I switched to being a boarder in 11th grade. Ha ha ha, boy did I show them that the library and dorm are absolutely fantastic places to socialize. We played family feud on literal desktop computers in the library, but otherwise we didn't have smartphones or other means of being individually distracted. We distracted each other with our own cleverness and idiocy in equal measure. We got in trouble, but for things like taking old jack-o'-lanterns and rolling them into oncoming traffic on Main Street, or sneaking out in the rain to go mudsliding across the quad after check-in. Now, to be fair to my younger self, I had a few things going on. I'm an only child raised by a single mother whom I adored and who was chronically ill for most of my childhood. Her illness really accelerated during my high school years. She died the winter of my senior year, and having just turned 18, I became a legally and financially independent adult. So perhaps somewhat understandable that PEMDAS and ionic bonds didn't hold the same relevance for me at that time as they may have for others. But what I was doing, consciously or not, was building myself a community and making friends that became my family. We are born with over 400 predetermined genetic traits. Curiosity has always been one of mine and comes up without fail in every SIC StrengthsFinder quiz I take. I love learning, and learning about people was my focus. This general inquisitiveness came naturally as I was at a boarding school for the first time. Where was this person from? What was their life story? What did they like to eat? What music did they listen to? I felt like I was absorbing so much from others' lived experiences that was influencing my own perspectives and interests. I think adolescence is like this. You try things on and see if you want to incorporate them into who you are. I loved being a social floater. Yes, I had friends with whom I was closest, but I really enjoyed mixing it up and being able to hang anywhere with anyone. I found that everyone had something to offer. There was a girl named Allie who lived across the hall from me in my junior year. She was a British baroness and introduced me to a then little known band called Coldplay. Una from San Francisco taught me about 90s hip hop and street style. Aurelia from Mexico City excelled in the art of Spanglish storytelling and successfully made bangs look cool. Harris from Tuscaloosa had traveled the world in the Vienna Boys Choir and could sing like a bird. Ned from Duxbury was a talented graffiti artist. Go figure. Perhaps because my own life was painful at the time, I wanted to cast outwards and take the attention off myself. I was a dedicated listener. Without the distractions we face with today's technology, I was very present. I also enjoyed goofing off in the ways I expressed earlier. Little did I know that research over 20 years later would reveal that I was on the right track. In his latest book, David Brooks writes about accompaniment as a means of getting to know someone, a relaxed and unhurried approach through the daily ebbs and flows of life. Boarding school lends itself well to this, with long dinner hours in the dining hall, bus rides to away games, and nights in the common room. He discusses the components of friendship building as patience, playfulness, other-centeredness, and presence. Patience means decelerating the pace of social life and lingering, enjoying the mundane, and getting to know someone in the small moments. Playfulness means embracing spontaneity and fun and reinforcing these positive feelings with laughter. Other-centeredness is giving up a sense of control and meeting someone where they are. And presence is about showing up, often without being asked. Above all, we humans crave a witness to our lives. That is the foundation of friendship. From an evolutionary perspective, connection has been about survival. And today, it's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. Research shows that people who have strong connections with others are happier and healthier. 
It affects us at a neurobiological level. Psychologist Arthur Aaron has revealed that sustained, escalating, reciprocal, personal self-disclosure fosters closeness. In other words, vulnerability. Being vulnerable requires trust and can be exceedingly difficult. That's true for me. I have spoken in chapel many times over the past 15 years. I've spoken about academic integrity, Native American and women's history, recently a lot of women's lacrosse statistics, the list goes on. But I've never delivered a chapel speech about myself. It's hard to get up here and be vulnerable, to pull back the curtain and share something personal. Brene Brown has identified that a challenge to this closeness fostered by vulnerability is perfectionism. If you are driven to impress, people please, or be perfect, the traits associated with that can actually push people away. People prefer vulnerability and imperfection. Authenticity is a requirement for connection and belonging. Back to high school me. When I reflect on this time, I feel in a lot of ways I was the best version of myself, despite the fact that I did not at all have it together. Why is that? I have wondered. Did I really peak in high school? The reason, I have realized, is that I was a very authentic version of myself. I was comfortable with vulnerability since people expected it of me, given what was going on with my mom. In a sense, I had been given permission to be imperfect, and with the pressure off, I was thriving, maybe not academically, but in my relationships. That was new for me. If you dial back to those 400 predetermined genetic traits I was talking about, an intrinsic drive, we'll call it perfectionism, was another one. Add in my beloved grandfather, Pops, who lived through the Great Depression and served in World War II, telling me that if you're going to do something, do it right. And if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And I had previously been a one woman, do my best, straight A earning, award pursuing, teacher and parent pleasing machine. In high school, when I shifted my focus off myself and how I present to others or earning their approval, I connected more deeply. I focused on my mom and my friends and had an incredible advisor. As Matthias shared recently about Mr. Moshe, my high school advisor was like a father to me. Do not underestimate the importance of a trusted adult in your life. Some funny things happened when I gave up on perfectionism too. I fell in love. A relationship that lasted four years, but the deep connection and growth that happened over the arc of that relationship and the ones after it helped to prepare me for the defining love of my life with Mr. Waters. I unequivocally believe that your first love is as real and impactful as any other relationship later in life. Enjoy it, sustain and nourish it, and learn from it. As you get older, there's something really special about maintaining friendships with people who knew you when you were a kid. They've seen you at different stages of life, and that continuity lends itself to a certain steadfastness. I also find that the social floater friendships I have enjoyed blossomed in unexpected ways. Yes, my three best friends from boarding school served as maids of honor at my wedding, and we just traveled together in January to celebrate our 40th birthdays. However, also fulfilling is that a kid I went to school with grades six through 12, and with whom I was always friendly, but who ran in a different circle, is now a buddy I see a few times a year. He has always remained the same humble goofball he was at age 11. I danced with him at his bar mitzvah in seventh grade, and now he's a speechwriter for Vice President Kamala Harris and gives me tours of the White House. In addition to being a floater, I would also advise you that as you move into the college years and beyond, pay attention to the friends of your friends. I went to St. Lawrence, which was in the middle of nowhere. My buddy Ian from CA went to Skidmore, which was only three hours and 11 minutes from SLU, so we'd visit each other because it was close. He had a group of 10 friends that lived together freshman year and remained tight throughout their four years. They used to show up to the sidelines of my lacrosse games when I played Skidmore, and it was like having 10 brothers there to cheer me on. One amongst them, Reed, moved to Boston after graduation, and we hung out a lot. Fast forward, and he is Cal's godfather, and my kids call him Uncle Reed and his wife Aunt Lindsay because they're a part of our family. In addition to Mr. Waters, their friendship has been the greatest gift of my life. I believe that you choose your family. For the occasion of this cum laude speech, I flipped through my high school yearbook 
and a classmate had this quotation on their senior page from Ray Bradbury. We cannot tell the precise moment when friendship is formed. As in filling a vessel drop by drop, there is at last a drop which makes it run over. So in a series of kindnesses, there is at last one which makes the heart run over. The people make this place. When you leave Brooks, you will carry them with you. Anthropologist Mary Bateson argues that we often shoehorn our lives into neat, linear stories of decision and then commitment. I decided to become a doctor and pursued my dream. She argues that many lives are not like that. They are nonlinear. They have breaks, discontinuities, and false starts. For example, the first job you take at 22 is not necessarily going to lead in a linear way to what you're going to be doing at 40. The first job I took out of college was at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. This year, I will serve as head of a school. Not to say one's better than the other, but they sure are different. As David Brooks says, our current self is just where we are right now, part of a long continuum of growth. I started this speech by telling you that I was a hot mess in high school and I loved every minute of it. I did. A lot of it was really hard. But I am grateful for the fullness of my high school years and the opportunity to reflect on it in the time since. I experienced struggle, failure, total denial about the severity of my mother's illness, her decline and passing, financial worry, depression, heartbreak, you name it. But in the midst of that, I learned about the power of vulnerability, the connection that authenticity enables, and the absolute joy and fullness that friendship and deeply knowing others can bring to your life. What a meaningful education. As senior class president, I spoke at our graduation. However, that day in early June, I received an empty diploma because I hadn't yet completed my coursework. As I go on to lead a new school next year, I am still 18-year-old me, and all the me's that came before the one that stands before you now. The wisdom I have gained has meant that I have become a more compassionate educator, that I can see the students I work with fully as complex individuals without judgment, and that I know a few years in your life doesn't determine the course of your life, but that you can grow from it. There is a proverb, if you don't change direction, you'll end up where you're headed. It's okay to do something out of character, make an unexpected choice or mess up. Who you are now is a part of who you'll become but doesn't define who you will be. It might even lead you to a more exciting future. Cum laude scholars, congratulations on your scholastic achievement that earned you this recognition. It is truly remarkable. Maybe your paths have felt linear, maybe not. Maybe because you've worked so hard during high school, you'll let your hair down a little bit this summer or in your post-secondary experience, whatever it may be. I hope you don't grow up too fast and that you are patient, playful, and present as you get to know people. Your health and happiness depend on it. Choose your family wisely and make some mistakes and cause a little mischief. Thank you. Mrs. Water <clears throat> Mrs. Waters, we are so grateful for how you've made us better over the years, for sharing your story, and for modeling vulnerability. Thank you. Next, the awarding of the certificates. Student honorees, the distinguished record you have made at Brooks School has won for you membership in the Cum Laude Society. The Society is a fellowship of scholars whose purpose is to recognize excellence in academic work. As you pursue your education, we hope that you will accept the honor of membership in the Society as a responsibility to contribute to the ongoing search for a greater understanding of humanity. The Greek motto of the Society is Erite, Dike, Time, or Excellence, Justice, Honor. Erite, includes the concept of excellence in the moral sense and is not limited to the ideal of superiority in scholarship, nor does it involve the endeavor of competing primarily for academic goals. 
DK includes the concept of what is suitable and appropriate, as well as just. TME includes the concept of dignity and truth, as well as honor. In testimony of your admission to the Cum Laude Society, by the authority of the society duly granted, we now present to you these certificates of membership. Mr. Packard, will you please join me in honoring our students, inductees. As your name is read, please come forward to accept your certificate and pin from Mr. Packard. To those gathered in support of these scholars, you may cheer your loudest and direct your positive energies their way as each name ha is read. Bernardo Camino Garcia. Tessa Catherine Dark. Jack Patrick Dawson. Eben Arthur Dooling. <laughs> Sophia Ann Fortenberry. Sanakshi Gosal Gupta. <laughs> Lana Keats Gibbs. <laughs> Aditya Ashwin Hyundai. Connor James Herlihy. <laughs> Gushwan Christina Liu. Caitlin Ann McDonald. <laughs> Marcello Anthony Maitino. Sylvia Rendell Marks. <laughs> Grant Emery Moore. Emma Rachel Plant. <laughs> Johan Jasmine Shi. Alexander Nicola Stanisha.
congratulations, new members of the Cum Laude Society. Your dedication to your studies is impressive, and we celebrate all the work you have put in. All please rise in body or spirit to sing the school hymn. Cum Laude Society, class of 2024, your families and school community are so proud of you. I have a few instructions for everyone before we leave. All Cum Laude members, their guests, and the faculty are invited to attend a luncheon in their honor immediately following this service in the Keating Room. Everyone else may enjoy lunch as normal in the Wilder Dining Hall. Please allow the new inductees and their families to process out first, followed by the faculty, and then students from front to back. New Cum Laude Society members should gather outside the chapel for a photo with Ms. Moran before proceeding to the Keating Room. By way of benediction, as I think about what Mrs. Waters shared with us about her journey, I close with these words from Brene Brown out of her book, Dare to Lead. When we have the courage to walk into our story and own it, we get to write the ending. Thus concludes the 2024 Cum Laude Induction Ceremony. Thank you. Thank you.